and Tommy had stuck out there at the wedding and taken photographs of it, and it had taken a year to paint it, um, and, it's, and it's a very prominent place in our home right now. But um, but that's the kind of thing that you get stories to hear about. Tommy was a romantic at heart, um, and uh, again, people who judge him on how he reacted to officials, you're just seeing a tiny sliver of the part. Yeah, you're, you're so right, Mike, and uh, you, you got us emotional. Um, you know, one thing about Tommy, Mike, you know, legions of Celtics fans grew up with him, but the respect opponents gave to Tommy, too. Speak to that for me. You guys had the best seat in the house. LeBron comes in. Whoever it is comes in. Uh, just what was that interaction like, you know, when, when you see a Hall of Famer like Tommy Hines, or, you know, for some of the young players coming up, eight rings as a player, two as a coach, what was that like? Uh, those interactions between some of the game's greatest stars and Tommy Courtside. It, it was it was really good to see. I mean, it was good to see players had some sort of depth because it, it's easy when you're 21, 22 two years old to think that ancient history is six years ago, seven years ago. So when I tried to tell them that Tommy was playing in, in the 1950s, they were just like, whoa, they, they, they couldn't nail that one. Um, but uh, at, the more they found out about him, the more they found out that he was one of the leaders, if not the leader, in forming the Players Union. Uh, he led the boycott in the Boston Garden, no less, uh, of the All-Star Game, where the teams weren't going to come out for the All-Star Game unless some things were settled with owners. And, and Tommy was the leader of those groups, and he was an activist, and um, he, he cared. Uh, I guess is the best way to put it. He cared. He, and he never begrudged the fact that these guys today were making these millions and millions of dollars, whereas he was selling life insurance in between games to try to uh, raise a family. So um, it was a very different time. But he was very much a part of it and very much an activist, as I said, in it. And, um, you know, he, he, he wrote a couple of books. That if, 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 one is called Give Him the Hook, which is, is really very good. Um, but again, he, this was a guy with a thirsty intellect who, who wanted to touch everything. And, and, and to get back to your point, though, because I keep going off on the artistic side, to get back on your point, it is good to see LeBron, to, who understands what Tommy brought to the game and what Tommy did for for them many many years ago and and there are guys and and the guys you expect chris paul comes by and says hello um the guys who get, who have done some work and get involved in the players union more and more find out the role that tommy heinsen had in their lives that they were unaware of and they're they're good enough to come over and talk it, it, it is fun to see tommy sit on the opposite side of the court 45 minutes an hour before the game just kind of beaches himself in one of those chairs and uh, the, the guys who come by are old, are young, are general managers, uh, and, and everybody gets the same shape from Trump. It was, uh, it was, it was good to see. He's, I, he, you don't even think about re replacing everything that he has done for the game of basketball. Yeah, Mike, you talked about all the different things that, that he's done, all the successes that he had. Do you, has he ever told you why he has that thirst for knowledge? Was it something it, it, when he was younger it started, as he got older? Was it you know him meeting Coos or Bill Russell? Why did Tommy uh, like sort of reach out and try to find out all this information where a lot of guys are just like happy that they're in their inner circle of basketball? Yeah. Sure. Um, well, Tommy, when he, was, when he was younger, had a little chip on his shoulder. A lot of guys who you would talk to who played against him or I would talk to, and that's what it was like to play against him. They're like, well, you know, he didn't want to get in his way. He didn't want to get near his elbows. He would dig him into you. He was, he was just tough. And he, he had something to prove, which, you know, he, he put up those remarkable numbers. Uh, oh, that's a great shot. He put up the uh, remarkable numbers in the uh, seventh game against St. Louis when the Celtics won their first championship. Uh, he went for 37 and 23, 37 points, 23 rebounds. And as he would tell you, he missed eight free throws in that game. So, um, but the Celtics won in double overtime. He was the star of the game. He was the rookie of the year that year, not Bill Russell. He was the rookie of the year. That hook shot off the glass, you, know, you gotta be kidding me. Um, he, again, he had a chip on his shoulder. To go back to your question though, Scott. He had a chip on his shoulder on the court. And then, as you know, Tommy retired from basketball when he was 30. Yeah, uh, you know, these injuries just caught up with him. So now he had to compete on another level, and he had a very sharp intellect, and, and he decided he'd compete on that level. And it, uh, you didn't want to talk about World War II unless you really came with your guns loaded, uh, because he knew all about it. He knew what Winston Churchill's plan was. He knew what this guy's plan was. Um, I, uh, the, 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 uh, spy novels. He devoured those authors. Um, he, again, he, he decided he couldn't play ball anymore and he was going to get you with the, with the smarts. And then came back, of course, and coached the two world championship teams. Um, there wasn't much less for him to do except, except come sit by me, which he did, which was <laughs> my big break. Yeah, it, it, speak to that 
that, Mike, because you, you guys called games together for 39 years, and, and I remember you always telling me the story. You know, you talk about Tommy prepared for the games, but it's not like he had notes courtside. And I know as a play-by-play -play person, you come prepared, you come with all these stats and ready for the game. Tell me that story, uh, uh, the message Tommy gave you that sort of impacted your career throughout. I remember this one. <laughs> That's a good one. <laughs> Well, we had we had done maybe a total of four games together, or five games together for Providence College, and that's where I first got a chance to work with Tommy. And Tommy was good on those games, but he was very much the kind of the guest analyst. Uh, it, we, we played, Providence played Holy Cross, and he was into that game, but the other games, he was, he was there, but he wasn't the real Tommy. And then came opening night against the Indiana Pacers in my first game as the Celtics uh, broadcaster. And Kyle, as you know, we all do the same thing. We've got these manila folders that we fold out, and, we write down it's so much useless information we'll never read. It's multicolored. It's every, everything you want. Everything you want is there. See, now that's 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 me and Tommy right there. That's we don't even need to look at each other. Um, but anyway, so I do my notes and I am just prepared. I am over prepared for this game. I got every stat you could possibly think of, every story you could possibly think of. I got the keywords written down in different colors and everything else. And I'm all set up. I spread myself out on the on the broadcast uh, table, which was in the old gondola in the old Boston Garden that hung off the first balcony. So um, Tommy's laying in there smoking a cigarette, and we're about three minutes from going on the air, and he goes, well, what's this blank? And he points to my notes. And uh, I said, those are my notes. And he goes, we're not going to need that, this blank. And he takes my notes, and he crumples them up in a ball, and he throws them off the first balcony. Okay. This is Kyle. You, you know, you know what this is like, Kyle. This is this is ten hours of work. Okay, right, right. Just, that's you know, some, your lifeline. Some little kid is running around. Yeah, some little kid is running around down there. Just look at I found. Look at I found. You know, it's multicolored. And Tommy looks at me, and I'm in shock. I'm thinking like, wow, this is good. Because another part of the story was when Tommy got Tommy got the job with Prism, and I think they gave him a four or five year contract. Uh, with me, when I asked for a one year contract, the guy I never got forget it. The guy looked at me and said. Let's just see how it goes first. <laughs> so, so, so I have I have no contract. I have no guarantee of anything. Um, and now my notes are all down there on the floor. And he's standing there with his arm around me, a cigarette burning in his hand. And he, he, he would call me kiddo, which I love, you know. And he said, hey, kiddo, we're going to talk about what we see. That's all we need to do. Um, and that's what we did for 39 years. We would sit down and talk about what happened in front of us, as opposed to as a lot of guys do, Paul Pierce goes to the free throw line and you hear 9,000 things about where Paul went to college, what his lifestyle, what he does, what he doesn't like. John was like, none of that bullshit. I don't want any of that stuff around at all. Um, and so that was great for me. So uh, I, as you guys know, I had Dick Life, who was the, the, the guru of stats, sitting in to give me numbers. And, and Tommy sitting on my left, I, I, I was a great position, Kyle. Really, I just liked into that one big time. And Mike, Tommy goes viral at least three four times a season with something he said now i'm gonna ask you you think that's planned or it's just tommy being tommy because i have a feeling if you watch the camera beforehand i feel like he's setting it up and i think he knows what he's about to do <laughs> well he, he he feels there's a need to, to be a spark and, and he's got a limited role as a broadcaster he can't really spark the whole line so um but uh, it, it's usually not calculated the thing scale you know this very well and Kyle, you do too um tommy thought playing the Lakers was exactly the same as playing the Orlando Magic. It didn't matter who the team was in the standings or anything else. It mattered that you were the Boston Celtics that particular night, and you needed to go beat this team, and you needed to treat them as if they were a big-time team, whether they were or whether they weren't. So that was one of the things. We went through a decade uh, of bad Celtic basketball in the uh, 80s and 90s. And, um, I mean, to hear Tommy, it was just that's where he was really at his best because that was a tough sell because this was not a, a good team for a good part of that time and uh tommy would figure a way to, to spark the interest in people but um you know again for all the referee baiting and, and the things he does the good referees in this league come over and they pay their respects to tommy before a game um they understand who he is and what he is and, and all he is is just a guy who really wants his team to win and he's a little louder than most and has a microphone so he is a little a uh, little different responsibility than the guy with the Budweiser in the second balcony. Um, but uh, Tommy's, Tommy's Tommy. Tommy's never going to be replaced. Tommy's, he's just bigger than life. Celtics lost their, their heart and their voice today. Yeah, Mike, no doubt about it. I, I was going to ask you about Tommy's relationship with the officials because 
you know, I, I, Tony Brothers, for instance, you know, Tommy was always yeah. riding him. But it, 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 I don't think it was ever personal, though, with Tommy. You know, it, like you said, no. it was a guy cheering on his team and wanting what's best for his team. Without question. And, and Tommy would bump into these guys and the car goes underneath and, and he would have a big grin on his face before he got to within 10 feet of them. Um, and he would say, like, you know, you still blew that call or whatever. And uh, <laughs> they, they would laugh. And, um, yeah, they, they knew who he was. I mean, he wasn't some young upstart coming along trying to make a reputation for himself by bad mouthing officials. This was a guy who, you know, had eight world championships as a player, two as a coach. And I think a lot of people around the country, Scal, I heard you saying this earlier, a lot of people around the country, basketball people, just thoroughly enjoyed listening to Tom. Sure, he was over the top, but uh, it, was, it was good over the top. It was quality over the top. What do, you, what, what do you think you'll miss most about going to the games and him not being there? Just the, the conversations before, because I do love the storytelling beforehand. Or is it the action in the games? Yeah, I mean, the, the, the press room will never be the same. No way. Um, you know, you just sit there and wait to see him making his way down the corridor and kind of walking at a little bit of an angle. Um, it, 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 that won't be the same. I, I enjoyed the time. I got to have a lot of time, obviously, with him over the past 40 years. But um, I, I don't just say in scout because all you have to do is throw a couple of key words out there and he'll start story about telling. And he, he loves to be the storyteller. Um, and uh, I will miss the press room with him. Uh, I, I just... I just miss hanging around with him. I mean, he, it, it was cool. I mean, Kyle, I'm 14 years old, climbing up the fire escape at the old Boston Garden and banging on the door of the second balcony until uh, somebody came over and either let us in or an usher came over and we ran back down the fire escape again. But um, we would get in the games and we'd start the second balcony by the fourth quarter. We were like 10 rows off the court. And I'm watching Tommy play. I'm watching Coos play. I'm watching Russell play. Um, and especially Tommy. And uh, so to all of a sudden spend 40 years of my life sitting beside this guy who I idolized when I was 10 years old because he had the uh, onions, as Raph would say, to take a hook shot off the glass with the game on the line. Um, he was just uh, to, to let him go. Yeah, Scal, I heard you talking about this at the top of the show. To just let him go and let him talk. Uh, you shot and they look at your watch and you realize it's middle of the first quarter and you just stole the press room. Right, right. <laughs> Everybody's wondering where you're at and the game started. Uh, Mike, how did you, I guess, develop that chemistry with Tommy? Because I, I remember when I first started working with him on pre up post days, I would refer, refer to him as Mr. Heinsohn. You know, I had that kind of reverence uh, for him. How did you, I guess, develop that chemistry? And, and I, I feel like you guys were such a perfect pairing for each other. You know, if not the longest, the longest, one of the longest uh, tandem duos out there when it comes to calling games. How did you develop that chemistry though? Well, I think one of the things was that, that I couldn't do what Tommy did, which was analyze the game. Uh, and so I never went near that whole area. Uh, and he didn't want to do what I did, which was <laughs> give the time, give scores. And so there was no conflict there in terms of one of us stepping on each other's toes. So right from the very beginning, I, I might step on his toes, but there were, there were moments like this here, which are just classic, where he's just going, run, Walter, run. <laughs> That's great stuff. That, and and um, yeah, the, time, the times with him, especially at, at, towards the end, the last couple of years, um, he, had, he had lost some of his energy, and energy was a big part of who he, who he is and who he's always been. Um, but uh, yeah, obviously, I have a hard time. That's my daughter right there. I have a hard time looking at that. No, sorry. I know. I, I understand, Mike. I mean, it's um, think about it. We don't know Celtics basketball without Tommy. Not at all. I mean, we just don't. Uh, I don't no, think we have. Go ahead, Mike. There's just there's there's no one to compare him to. Right. No. Um, I mean, I mean, a player, a coach, a broadcaster. How long have you been a broadcaster? For? Thirty years. I mean, I, I used to say sometimes when I when I introduce him at like a banquet or something, I'd say like if you're over sixty, you know Tommy is a player. If you're over 40, you know Tommy is a coach. If you're over 20, you know Tommy is a broadcaster. And if you're under 10, you think he's Shrek. Um, and <laughs> he loved that intro. It, the first time I gave it to him, he said to me after, he goes, he goes who's Shrek? What's Shrek? I said, Shrek, Shrek's an ogre, but it, 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 he's a good guy. And so I said, he's a good guy. I said, he's a good guy. He says, okay, you can use that whenever you want. That's good. I mean, 
<laughs> oh, that's good stuff. No doubt. Mike T uh, Gorman, the voice of the Celtics, 39 years with uh, Tommy Hines. And Mike, we, when you look back, well, what's Tommy's legacy, I guess, going forward? What, what's his impact on, you know, whether it's broadcasting, the Celtics organization, the people of Boston? What do you think that is? Um, I think he does have a tremendous impact as a broadcaster as I look across the table at scale. Um, I, I, I think he does. And I think what he frees uh, color commentators in Boston in the future and scale, this will be you. Um, you can be a Celtic fan. It's okay to be a fan. Um, you, you don't want to be irrational. You don't want to go too far over the top. But uh, you, you should be rooting for the home team. And, um, with all the satellite packages and everything they have now, if somebody wants to see their home broadcast, they can go see them. And that's the way it should be. And, and, and broadcasters shouldn't try to be neutral. I don't want to hear a neutral voice. I want to hear a voice that either makes me mad or makes me rally behind it, but I don't want a neutral voice. So I, I think that's a legacy that Tommy leads, and it's okay to be over the top about your team and who you are. Um, and again, you can't speak enough to what he did early in, in his career in terms of a legacy. He, he organized guys. He, he got guys to understand what their merit was, what their worth was, and, and, and was able to go in and negotiate and to play hardball with the best of them when hardball was what was necessary. Uh, again, just a, um, I mean, a prolific painter. I mean, it's not, this is not a guy, I'm not talking about a guy who's painted by the numbers here. He's, this, is a, this is a prolific painter uh, whose, whose works are very, very good. Um, again, just his legacy is hopefully that people will realize how, what a multi-sided guy he was uh, and that he wasn't just this guy who was saying, that's ridiculous. <laughs> Mike Gorman, looking forward to uh, having you back on the call in, in a month and a half when the Celtics open up uh, the 2021 season. Uh, Mike, thanks so much. Uh, let, me, let me be the first to throw yeah. something in you, and maybe you guys can help out. Um, I'd love to see Tommy's number on everybody's uniform this year. Yeah. Just, one, just one year. I'm with that's you. Right. No, you know, you know, you know, it's been a while. Yeah, that's, uh, that, that's, uh, we'll, uh, we have some interviews later on in the show. We'll see if we can throw that in there, Mike. Yeah, if you can, you folks appreciate that, guys. No, and, and, and not just Celtics either, Mike. Like when, when Scow and you talk about what he did for the Players Union, the Players Association coming up. Mm -hmm. I mean, this is a guy that's been a part of the NBA, helped grow it for 60 plus years. And so I, I agree with you. Not only, uh, the Celtics should honor him. I, I think the entire league should. Um, his impact, you know, around the league is, is greatly felt, no doubt about it. Yeah. And I know it's hard to, it's hard to do on short notice, but it, um, you guys, what you're doing here for the next hour or so, this is, this is really nice. NBC, there you go, guys. That's really good. All right, Mike Gorman. We'll see you soon. Mike, thanks so much for jumping on okay. the show. As we discussed, the icon one Tommy Heinsohn. You know, Tommy had... A tremendous playing career, obviously, coaching career and broadcasting career. And one of his closest friends throughout it all was his former teammate, Bob Cousy. Our Chris Forsberg had a chance.